wanted to start off with just a few thank yous before I turn the program over to our moderator. Uh, and I have to start by thanking Mass Humanities. So Mass Humanities is the organization that's responsible for funding today's event. The Reading Frederick Douglass program takes place all around Massachusetts. And this year, there are 41 sites around the state. Yay. And this is the third year that we are here at Historic Northampton for this reading. So can we also do a round of applause for Historic Northampton? Another round of applause, of applause for Northampton Open Media, which is filming today's event. And I won't read them all, but I would invite you to look at the posters or to go online and to see the over two dozen organizations in our community that are supporting today's event. So a round of applause for all of them as well. I would like to introduce today's moderator. So Sarah Patterson is an assistant professor of English at UMass Amherst, where she specializes in African American literature and culture. She is an authority on the colored conversations, which were black organizations that advocated for freedom in the 19th century. And in chatting with Sarah when she arrived today, I also found out that she's the co-editor of a book called Colored Conventions Movement. Now she told me that this book is available on Amazon, but I'm willing to bet that if you go into any of our wonderful local bookstores, they will order it for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Colored Conventions Movement, co-edited by Sarah Patterson. And with that, I will turn the program over to her. Yes. Love the mic. That one. I'll try this one. Yes. Like a kiss. All right. <laughs> so I want to begin with a land back statement. Historic Northampton acknowledges that we stand on indigenous land. Um, the place we now call Northampton was known to Native people as Nettleton. Now on Frederick Douglass, the real master of ceremony today. <laughs> Frederick Douglass's life spanned from 1818 to 1895. After escaping from slavery in 1838, his family re relocated to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he began his rise through the highest ranks of the American abolitionist community. Today, we remember Douglass as a consummate professional and enduring moral compass. His calls, his powerful calls for human rights in the face of tyranny, continues to restore our faith in the goals of equality and the tools of democracy as we reach toward the horizon of a more perfect union. This public reading of What to the Slave is the Fourth of July helps us to situate the magnitude of his influence as a reformer, a statesman, and an author. The speech joins a substantial body of career writings and public appearances, including four autobiographies, three newspapers, and one short story entitled The Heroic Slave, published in 1853. The speech, delivered July 5th, 1852, at an event organized by the Ladies, the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester, responded to the interconnected troubles of the 19th century, the mid-century, with equal parts eloquence and righteous indignation. Namely, it challenged the legitimacy of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, part of the Compromise of 1850. The act appointed commissioners imbued with powers of any U.S. Justice of the Peace or Magistrate to arrest, imprison, and assign bail to fugitives from justice and persons escaping from the service of their masters. Moreover, a fee of $1,000 awaited any white marshal who refused to carry out a commissioner's directive. The Supreme Court's 1857 Dred Scott decision further empowered slave owners and bounty hunters. As such, we remember the Fugitive Slave Act as the mantelpiece of a domestic politi political agenda based in dystopian philosophies of race, capitalism, and legal bondage. In contrast, Douglas reframed this conversation for the public, 
centralizing the perspective of who we might call the citizen slave. Accordingly, black people were not only citizens, but were obligated to state this claim to citizenship. He compared the slave's access to political freedom to the sanctity of religious deliverance. He likened the slave's access to civil liberties to the very fulfillment of one's humanity. And he positioned the abolitionist cause as the very execution of the greatest principles outlined in the Declaration of Independence. Now, less is known about Douglas as a perennial delegate and officer for colored conventions across 40 years between 1840 and 1880. Instrumental to the movement was this lecture circuit for emerging black spokespersons to serve as authorities on the condition of black people in the United States and the policies and initiatives for their improvement. Namely, a year after delivering this speech that will be today, Douglas chaired a committee on the Declaration of Sentiments at the 1843-1853 National Color Convention in Rochester, New York. The pamphlet followed, as you might remember, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's re release of the Declaration of Sentiments at the 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls. Now, Douglas' version, Douglas's version of the decree focused on the practice of American identity among all that inhabited the land and called upon the government to acknowledge that the Constitution of the United States was formed to establish justice, promote general, general welfare, and to secure the blessing of liberty to all the people of this country. And he also suggested that we all should resist tyrants as obedience to God. Such genealogies of documents remind us that Douglas and members of the African American intelligentsia collectively produced a great body of opinions and campaigns that still sustain our reach for social justice today. Super excited about today. Let me tell you how we're gonna get started with logistics. We're going to begin with uh, readers lining up by order. The people in the first, uh, with the first 10 paragraphs shall line up in, uh, in line up here uh, by Representative Sabadosa. The number one person should be at this microphone, and the person who is next will inhabit the next microphone. And so with every free microphone, the next reader will come up. Um, when the first line goes down, everyone who is in the next group, so 11 through 20, you should begin to line up. So all we ask is that you keep attentive, uh, keep attentive to where we are in the order. Um, all right. Uh, Representative Lindsay Sabadoso will be our first reader, and Mayor Gina Louise, Louise um, Shara will do the honors of being the last reader. And we'll get started now. Thank you. President, friends, and fellow citizens. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen. The distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This, to you, is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance. 
This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. You are, even now, only the beginning of your national career, still lingering in, this period, in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. Fellow citizens, 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people, in which you now glory, was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government. England is the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home, imposed in the exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as, in its mature judgment, it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the idea of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to live it differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought to, as not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need to say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty, men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and, rem and remonstrated. They did not Decor respect, to be respectful and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Yet they persevered. Oppression makes a man mad. Your fathers became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we, at this distance of time, regard it. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful. But amid all their terror and affrighted vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on in the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of lovers of ease and the worshipers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. We seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day whose transparency is at all equal it. Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded. And today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours. And you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it 
and perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by these principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and whatever cost. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did, and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They love their country better than their own private interests, and all who can see that it is a rare virtue that ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. Your fathers staked their liberty, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the cause of their country. In their admiration of liberty, they lost sight of all other interests. They were peace men, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against the oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. For them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements? How unlike the politicians of an hour? Their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away into the distant future. Mark them. Fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them, your fathers, the fathers of this republic, laid the cornerstone of the national superstructure which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. Our eyes are met with demonstrations of joyous enthusiasm. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They have all been taught in your common schools, narrated at your firesides, unfolded from your pulpits, and thundered from your legislative halls, and are as familiar to you as household words. They form the staple of your national poetry and eloquence. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your fathers to others. My business, if I have any today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever-living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time, your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work and have done much of it well. You live and must die and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of your fathers. Unless your children are blessed by your labors, you have no right to wear out, waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your endless. <coughs> Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, 
Why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you, this day, rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join in joyous anthems wherein human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, Above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view. Standing here, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity which is outraged, in the name of liberty which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and of the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. 
I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. I fancy I hear someone of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists failed to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What? Point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of a slave to read or write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dog is in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. Is it not the stone? Astonishing that what we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretary, having among us doctors, lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we encourage all and all manner of enterprises, common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, active, thinking, planting, Living in families as husbands, wives, children, to no book, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian God and looking for life and mortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice, hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom? To do so would make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What? Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with iron, 
to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters? Must I argue that a system less marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than some arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, lasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crime against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What? to the American slave is your 4th of July. I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants brass fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, <coughs> and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of <coughs> Savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts side by side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Take the American slave trade, which we are told by the papers is especially prosperous just now, as the price of men was never higher and is carried on in all large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy. This trade is one of the peculiarities of American institutions. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called the internal slave trade in order to divert it from the horror with which the foreign slave trade is <coughs> contemplated. The foreign slave trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy, as an execrable traffic. To arrest it, this nation keeps a squadron at an immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic, opposed alike to the laws of God and of man. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade. The men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation, and their business <coughs> is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade. 
the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you'll see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover? I'll show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You'll see one of these human flesh joggers, armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of 100 men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold, singly or in lots, to suit purchasers, their food for the cotton field, and the deadly sugar meal. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives there. See the old man with locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See to that girl of 13 weeping, yes, weeping as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. The drive moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly, you hear a quick snap like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. That scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow this drove to the waters. Attend the auction. See men examined like horses. See the forms of women. Shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove, sold and separated forever. And never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from the scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where, under the sun, you can witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the ruling part of the United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. The fleshmongers gather up their victims by dozens and drive them, chained, to the General Depot at Baltimore. When a sufficient number has been collected here, a ship is chartered for the purpose of conveying the forlorn crew to Mobile or to New Orleans. From the slave prison to the ship, they are usually driven in the darkness of night. In the deep, still darkness of midnight, I have been often aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chained gangs that pass our door. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is today an active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the south. I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, the priest, and the capacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. But a still more inhuman, disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented by an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, Slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia. And the power to hold, hunt, and sell women, men, women, and children 
as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner and American Christianity. Where these go, may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state and force has a duty you owe to your freedom and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have, within the past two years, been hunted down and without a moment's warning, hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread, but of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God and freedom. For black men, there is neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary of black men into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself. The Minister of American Justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be sundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king-hating, the least loving, democratic, Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless, <coughs> and in diabolical intent. This fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You hurl your anathemas at the crowned-headed tyrants of Russia and Austria, and pride yourselves on your democratic institutions while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad. Honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land, you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. <coughs> your glory and your refinement and your universal education, yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of a nation, a system begun in avarice, supported in pride, and perpetuated in cruelty. 
you shed tears over fallen Hungary and make the sad story of her wrongs the themes of your poets, statesmen, and orators till your gallant sons are ready to fly to arms to vindicate her cause against the oppressor. But in regard to the 10,000 wrongs of the American slave, you would enforce the strictest silence and would hail him as an enemy of the nation who dares to make these wrongs the subject of public discourse. You were all on fire at the mention of liberty for France or for Ireland, but are as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved American. You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bare your bosom to the storm of British artillery to throw off a three-penny tax on tea, and yet wring the last hard-earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that of one blood, God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth, and have commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet, you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skins are not colored like your own. You declare before the world, and are understood by the world to declare, that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and yet you hold securely in a bondage which, according to your own Thomas Jefferson, is worse than ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose, a seventh part, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism a sham, as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force in your government the only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it. And yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Be warned, a horrible reptile is boiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. But it is answered in reply to all this that precisely what I've now denounced is, in fact, guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States, that the right to hold and to hunt slaves is a part of the Constitution framed by the illustration fathers of the Republic. Then I dare to affirm, notwithstanding all I have said before, your fathers, instead of being the honest men I have before declared them to be, were the fairest impostors that ever practiced on mankind. This is the inevitable conclusion. And from it, there is no escape. But I differ from those who charge this baseness on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least, so I believe, have, as 
I think, fully and clearly vindicated the Constitution from any design to support slavery. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other as they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done, but a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let every heart join in saying it, please everyone join me. All God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow. In every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood, and each return for evil good not blow for blow. That day will come all views to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. the words, the powerful words of Frederick Douglass from over 171 years ago. How magnificent. I'm truly inspired. I'm sure all of you are inspired as well. And I believe as benefactors of this creed, we are prepared to meet the challenges of the 21st century and beyond. Those including social justice for our LGBTQ friends, for people of color, brown and black, uh, for those who are homeless, um, for climate change, for our, our handling of nuclear energy, affirmative action, the debt, the student debt crisis, health care, and more. We have to be prepared, and we're thankful that Douglas is helping us sustain this energy for social change. Enjoy. Enjoy your afternoon. Goodbye.